Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. Well, I heard the story about a man who was sitting in a diner uh, eating a bowl of uh, alphabet soup. And he, he would look into the bowl of alphabet soup and stare, and, and then he would write something on a pad. And then he'd look back and he would stare, and then he would write something else on his pad. And the fellow next to him, a little confused, so what, what are you doing there? And he said, well, I'm, uh, I'm trying to discover God's will for me today and and I look in the alphabet soup and when it spells a word I write it down and that's how I get God's will for the day the guy said well what what have you learned so far what has God told you so far and the guy looked at his pad and said well so far God goes oh and the fellow looked in the bowl of soup and said that's not alphabet soup those are Cheerios So today we conclude our series, Finding God's Blueprint for My Life. And, and <laughs> tragically, there are a lot of unhealthy methods of trying to discover God's will for your life. Uh, you will not find it looking into a bowl of alphabet soup or Cheerios for that matter. A lot of bad methods. I heard about a, a farmer one day looked up in the sky and clears a bell, the cloud formation spelled out three letters, big, bold letters, uh, real clear, GPC. And he kept staring at those letters, GPC. And he said, God is calling me to go preach Christ. And so he quit his farming. He went out as an evangelist. And after one year, it was a miserable failure. He was a horrible evangelist. He did not lead one person to Christ. He went and complained to his wife. He said, I saw a GPC, and I, clearly God was saying, go preach Christ. And his wife said, well, maybe God was saying, go plant corn. <laughs> Hopefully in this series we have learned healthier methods of finding and fulfilling God's plan and God's will for our lives. Now, it's very important as followers of Christ that we learn how to follow Christ. How do we follow God's will, God's blueprint? But, you know, learning it and doing it are two different things. It can, it can be tough following God's will. As soon as you make a decision... Okay, I'm really going to obey God's will for my life. I'm going to make that a top priority of my life. You will quickly discover obstacles. There will be barriers placed in the road on your desire and on your journey to fulfill God's purpose for your life. And so we're going to look at some of those today, some of those obstacles that we can expect to encounter. In fact, we're going to look today at an amazing period of time in the Apostle Paul's life. He, uh, he faced this very challenge of wanting to do God's will and yet running into these barriers. It, we're going to see in our text today that God made his will very clear to Paul. There was no doubt about it. And yet the minute Paul learned of, his, of God's will, he started running into these barriers. The story is told in Acts 20. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, Acts 20 is the place we will begin. A little backstory here, Acts 20. Paul, at this point in, uh, in his life, is at the end of what is known as his third missionary journey. Okay? 
at the end. He has been working with a number of churches in Macedonia, in Greece, Asia Minor, what is today known as Turkey. And while he is at the end of this journey, suddenly God makes very clear to Paul that he is to leave Asia Minor and head to Jerusalem. Now, it is at this point in the journey that Paul runs into three obstacles. Obstacles to living out God's blueprint for his life. So here's the deal. Today, from Paul's example, we're going to learn these three obstacles. We're going to learn how do you expect them to come and how to handle them when, not if, but when they come. What can you expect if you say, okay, I'm going to live God's blueprint. Here's what you can expect. Number one, expect uncertainty. Expect uncertainty. And that exact, just what you wanted, you know? <laughs> I want to do God's will and I get confronted with uncertainty. Look at Acts 20, verse 22. This is Paul speaking and he says, and now, compelled by the Spirit, in other words, the Holy Spirit is leading him, giving him direction, and now compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, now look at this, not knowing what will happen to me there. Now don't read over that too quick. I'm going to Jerusalem, the Spirit has made it clear I'm to go to Jerusalem, and when I get there, I have no idea what's going to happen. Can you spell uncertainty? By the way, have you ever noticed in your own life how God has a, has a habit of revealing the next step in your journey, but not the entire itinerary? Anybody figured that one out? God will give you the next step, but he doesn't tell you what's going to happen next week, next month, next year. It's like you're going to Jerusalem, but you don't know what's going to happen when you get there, that uncertainty. God has a way of revealing part but not all of his plan for Paul. We can expect God to do the very same in our lives. Now, I've been wondering about this. I'm going, okay, that's what God did. Why? Why would God tell Paul where to go, but not give him the details of what's going to happen when he gets there? Why would God give you and me the next step in our journey, but not give us a little more detail when we get there? I think I learned why. God is teaching us to, to walk by faith, not by sight. You've heard that verse. God is really big into this faith thing. I mean, he actually wants us to trust him with the whole journey and to trust him to give us one step at a time. No further, just one step at a time. He's teaching us to walk by faith. He doesn't give us all the details because when he doesn't give us the details, we have to trust him. We just have to kind of step out and say, okay, God, uh, I, I'm going to put my faith in you. I'm going to trust that you're going to get me there. And then once I get there, you're going to meet my needs and reveal more of your plan. Now, I thought of a, a few examples of this. I want you to think about this. Uh, any parents in the room? Any parents in the room? Yeah. Um, having children. If God had told you all the details of raising children, there would be no children. <laughs> it would be the end of civilization as we know it today. And, you know, that's why I, I've watched uh, parents who've raised their kids and kind of sent them out into the world. And then when, when young couples, you know, get married and they have a kid and they're all excited and, you know, they say, oh, this is the most wonderful thing in the world. And I see these seasoned parents just smile. <laughs> God doesn't give you all the details. No. Tell you what, another example. Uh, anybody here use GPS in their car on your phone? Yeah, everywhere Mary and I go, if we didn't have that, well, we just wouldn't go anywhere because we'd get lost. But have you noticed when you're listening to the, I call her the GPS lady, have you noticed that she will give you the next step 
but that's it. You're driving down the interstate and it'll come on in a quarter of a mile, take exit 222. So you're driving along and sure enough there's exit 222 and you pull off 222 and you're coming off the road and, and you're going, okay, I've never been here before. What do I do? What do I do? Come on, GPS lady, speak up, speak up. Get in the left lane. Oh, and just in time, just in time, she tells me, I get in the left lane. Okay, now what? Oh, now there's a light coming. Do I go left, right, straight? When you get to the light, turn left. She, she pushes me to the edge. <laughs> Every time. I'm going, come on, lady, how hard would it be to say, take exit 222, stay in the left lane, and when you come to the light, turn left? It's not that hard. You've been there. Now, don't repeat this, but God is like the GPS lady. He gives you the next step. In your notes, living God's blueprint is like following a treasure map with additional clues given along the way. You don't get them up front. You don't get a book of the clues. No, you get the next clue, and then you... Then you go there, and then you discover, oh, here's the next clue. And then you go, oh, here's the next clue. That's the way God leads us because he wants us to learn he's trustworthy. If we hope to live God's blueprint, you, like Paul, can expect what? Uncertainty along the way. Now, here's another obstacle in living God's will. Number two, you can expect hardship. You can expect hardship. All right, let's pick up the read. The very next verse, Paul's still speaking, verse 23, he says, I only know, okay, here's what Paul does know. I only know that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. Hardship. God makes it very clear to Paul that he can expect hardship and even opposition all along the way to Jerusalem. We can expect the very same in our lives. I want to read a verse of scripture to you that you have probably never had calligraphied this is not one of those verses, you know, you put on the refrigerator door. You don't see these engraved on plaques hanging on walls. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12, it's still scripture, and it says, In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be, will be, not may be, not could be, will be what? Persecuted, hardship. Listen, if you're going to follow Christ, you're going to catch it. You are going to catch it. In your notes, living God's blueprint is always the right way, but it's not always the easy way. It's always the right way, but don't think it's the easy way. Now, I don't know, some of you, some of you may be thinking right now, um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever been persecuted. I've never been ridiculed for being a Christian or poked fun of or excluded. Well... Maybe you aren't living enough of a godly life to set you apart. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna get the stream coming at you as long as you're swimming with the current. But as a believer, when you turn against the culture, that's when you're gonna catch it. So Paul just says, get ready. If you're gonna follow Christ, it's not gonna be easy. In your notes, here's a good question. If you were arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you in a court of law? I hope so. I hope they would have so much evidence in you, they would throw you in prison because it's crystal clear that you are a follower of Jesus Christ. Is it ever God's will for us to suffer? Here's another verse you will never see on a refrigerator door. 1 Peter 3.17 for it is better if it is, what? 
We're talking about God's will. Okay, it, for it is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Do you realize that there are times when it is God's will for you to suffer? And that is when you make a decision, I'm going to do good. I'm going to do the right thing no matter what kind of heat I catch. No matter what kind of opposition I meet, I am going to do the right thing. People can laugh at me. They can make fun of me. They can oppose me. It doesn't matter. I am going to live God's blueprint, and I'm going to expect hardship. All right, there's a third obstacle Paul met and we will meet. Expect number three, misunderstanding. You can expect misunderstanding. Now, this is in the next chapter, Acts chapter 21. Paul is still on his journey heading toward Jerusalem. And, and now the opposition, strange enough, comes from friends, people who passionately love Paul. Chapter 21, verses 10 through 14. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, quote, in this way the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. Well, when we heard this, the we here is Luke and Paul's friends. When we heard this, we and the people there pleaded with Paul not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> I, I love this next slide. When he, Paul, would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, well, the Lord's will be done. <laughs> Isn't that great? Well, since we can't talk Paul out of not doing the will of God, well, okay, let the Lord's will be done. Interesting. The Bible says that when a person becomes a Christian, you guys remember this, the angels in heaven rejoice when a person becomes a Christian. However, sometimes friends and family don't. Sometimes uh, I've learned a new Christian's first challenge is the misunderstanding from family and friends, the people closest to him or her. I've also discovered the same is true when you decide to do the will of God. When you say, I'm going to do the will of God in my life, no matter what the cost, no matter who isn't behind me, I'm going to do the will of God no matter what. When, when Paul's friends realized the imminent danger of his trip to Jerusalem, what did they try to do? Man, they said, don't go, Paul. Man, we can't lose you. You stop this crazy thinking. Didn't you just hear and the prophet Agabus? The prophet Agabus said, you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound and, and persecuted there. And, you know, of course, Paul is going, well, duh, read chapter 20. <laughs> I already knew that was coming. That's no news to me. And yet they're saying, well, listen, the prophet of God says you're going to get injured if you go there, so don't go there. Paul says, no, no, don't break my heart. Now, don't, I love Paul's friends, don't you? They, their concern is well attended, intended, very much so. There, there's only one problem. They're dead wrong. When it comes to the will of God, they're dead wrong. Their heart's in the right place. They're just dead wrong. We can expect the very same thing in our lives. I, I remember back, I don't know, it's been a few years, there was a, a, a young couple in Roswell, and God clearly called them to the foreign mission field. And they were, God called them to go overseas, and, and they were excited about it, and uh, the, the church got behind them and supported them, and 
there was only one group who opposed them. Anybody want to guess? It was their family. Their family. You know, grandma and grandpa, don't you dare take my kids over the ocean. Those are my grandkids. Don't you dare do that. And it it really created a, a pretty severe friction in that family, just like with Paul. Now, the good news is, finally, that family came to the conclusion, okay, the Lord's will be done. Friends and family. In your notes, friends and family can be sincere, but sincerely wrong. That's why we must seek to know God's will for our lives, and then once we know it, we must live it out. Even if those closest to us don't agree, don't support, even if they oppose that decision to do the will of God. I was thinking about the Old Testament guy named Job. You guys ever read the whole book of Job? It's a fascinating book. And, you know, basically, you know, Job's Job's life falls apart. He loses everything. And his friends come to help him out. With friends like that, who needs enemies? You read the story and Job's friends come. And basically, Job's friends say, uh, Here's the problem. The reason you're suffering is there is sin in your life. So Job, here's God's will for your life. God's will for your life is confess your sin and then God will heal you and restore everything. But Job, there's sin in your life, so God's will is you confess your sin. Now, those of you who have read the book, what was wrong with that? They were well-intentioned. They were just dead wrong. That was not the reason of Job's suffering. God had a bigger plan that they did not understand. I I say all that so you will understand there will be times when you are convinced, crystal clear, this is God's will for my life. It may be a relationship. It may be a job. It may be a move to a new city. It could be a thousand things. And you prayed and you sought God and God's will is clear You can expect obstacles. Don't think that once you know God's will, man, it's clear sailing. I'll get nothing but applause from those around. No. Paul would say, Job would say, expect some opposition from your friends. Expect people who love you, care about you, expect them just to misunderstand what God is doing in your life. A little little side note here. This is why you must be very careful in, in discerning and living out God's will. You have to be very careful with this one, where someone comes up to you and says this, God told me to tell you. Very careful. God told me to tell you I could write a book on horror stories of people's lives that were destroyed and devastated because someone they loved and respected came and said, God told me to tell you, and they just acted on that, and it was devastating, terribly devastating. I've seen marriages that should have never happened ruined because somebody said, God told me to tell you two to get married. And then they got married, and it was not a marriage made in heaven. So here's, here's a good rule of thumb that I use because, uh, uh, I don't know, there's something about pastors that maybe we have a sign on our back that says, please come and tell me God's will for my life. <laughs> so I, I've, I've seen this over the years. So here's the rule of thumb that I use. Uh, as a general rule, use this kind of advice as confirmation, not direction. You get it? Confirmation, not direction. In other words, if you've kind of been moving in this direction and you're sensing that's God's lead, and then friends and family come along and say, you know what, I want to confirm that. I think that does fit you. That is a wise decision. You can use that advice as what? Confirmation, not 
Well, I, I never thought about moving to Zambia as a missionary, but you know that guy, he looked right at me and said, God told me to tell you you're going to Zambia as a missionary. Make sure you ha you kind of been thinking about Zambia. There's a map of Zambia in your bedroom. You know, little things like that. Use it as confirmation, not direction. Hey, by the way, that, that advice, that is free. You don't have to pay for that today. Get it just for coming. If you hope to live out God's blueprint, just like Paul, guys, just like Paul, expect well-meaning people to misunderstand. There's a great passage of scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2. I did, did I give you the quote from Job? I don't know if, did I give you that? Okay, I think I did. Uh, Job's friends thought that he had all the answers to explain Job's situation, but they were just wrong. They were just wrong. I don't know if that's a fill-in or not, but I'm going to give it to you free. 1 Peter 4, 2. This, this is an amazing verse, and it's in the TEV version, but listen to this. From now on, then, you must live the rest of your earthly lives, how? Controlled by God's will and not by human desires. That, that verse will change your life. Say, so God, for the rest of my life, I'm going to live, I'm going to live controlled by your will, not my will be done. Yeah, we, uh, we need to know God's will, no doubt about it. But once you know it, you need to live it, controlled by the will of God. So in the process, though, guys, please, please know it's not going to be clear sailing. You can expect uh, uncertainty. Not, you're not always going to know all the details down the way. Uh, hardship, it's not always going to be the easy way, and misunderstanding. Our decision will not always please and win everyone's approval. We've got to be ready to face and overcome each of these obstacles. Otherwise, here, here's what will happen. You will be detoured from living out God's will for your life. You, you'll fall into the trap of knowing God's will, but not living God's will. So as I look back over the series, but especially today's message, I come away with one big lesson, and I share this with you for your notes. At the end of the day, guys, at the end of the day, living God's will always requires a step of faith. It always requires that stepping out, trusting God, and giving God credit to be faithful. Now, if you are willing, if you're willing to take that step of faith, you can not only know God's blueprint, you can actually live it every day. Let's pray. Well, Lord, thank you. Thank you for caring enough for us that you don't just have us living aimlessly through life. There really is a path. You do care about us, and you have a plan for us. You have a purpose for us. Thank you for the Apostle Paul, for his wonderful example of facing uncertainty, hardship, misunderstanding, and Lord, through it all, we know the end of the story. We know Paul arrived in Jerusalem, God, and, and everything that you said would happen did happen. And yet, Lord, through it all, your will was done in his life. I pray, Lord, as we commit the rest of our lives to be controlled by your will, that we will live it daily with joy in our heart, no matter what we face, knowing, Lord, that even though it may not be the easy way, it's the right way. And for that, we give you praise and thanks through Christ our Lord. Amen.